the beginning was a home. And the home was God's peace and God was peace. The foundation lay before the foundations of the world that all the lost might find in him a resting place. See now that peace has come again. In the midst of chaos, the spirit of God hovered over the waters of a womb, stepped out of his comfort to bring comfort into our crazy, walked away from heaven to bring heaven into our hectic for us. Peace has left its country to make of us citizens, leaves his home, becomes an immigrant that we might become natives through nativity. Peace has come. Watch as wise men bring housewarming gifts. As the Holy One moves into the neighborhood to dwell amongst humanity, peace has come. Watch the Son of God become the son of a carpenter, his tiny hands destined to build his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Watch as the high king of heaven becomes the lowly prince of peace that all the placeless might find their place in him. The builder becomes his building. Willingly opens himself that we might enter into the house of the father, the architect of the galaxy, sends his son to be born among those he knows won't even offer him a place to stay, I'll admit. I too have shut up places in my heart, left no room for God's peace to make its home in me, made a busy town of my life and filled every end with my selfishness and my desires and my ego and my fear and we all did the same. And our world became a world of homeless nations and we all contributed to the restlessness that we also desperately wanted to be set free from. But praise be to God that peace has finally come at last. Peace has come to end the exile and bring us all back home, to be reconciled to God's heart and find shelter in the peace of his presence. And in this house, there's unity. For the offended became a truce and lived among the offenders. And the blessing of this birth is that through him, we all can be born again. And in this house, there's rest, that all the weary may lay burdens down. For what came through labor pains is the healer of every pain and the carrier of every load. Christ is our home. And in this house, there's peace. Watch as swords are beaten into plowshares. Enemies are turned into children and the father receives glory for he has sent the son. Peace has come. May we be open. May we be ready. May we be prepared to receive the coming of our king, the coming of peace. Peace has come. Peace has come? Some of the words that Lowe spoke were were beautiful. In the beginning was a home, and the home was God's peace, and God was peace. And in this house there's rest that all the weary may lay burdens down, and in this house there's peace. How do you feel about that? Do you think, yeah, absolutely, peace has come, or are you sort of like peace? has come, like I want peace, I long for peace. Um, The peace, the image of peace that is in my head when I think peace looks a little like this. (laughs) Stephen, try the other one. Try the other picture, Stephen. You are awesome, by the way. Our media team is amazing, and I love it, but when I give him a whole lot of things. All right, he'll get it up there, but let me describe this picture to you. It's a Norman Rockwell painting, and it's this picture of this beautiful mom. You'll let me know when it gets up there. Um, It's this beautiful mom that is dressed in this little red and white um, outfit, white satin skirt, y'all, women. Who wears white? It's gonna get dirty, right? But her hair is beautifully coiffed and her, there's not like one ounce of stress on her face. Her hands are gently placed in her hands and her sweet son is kneeling in front of her and the son is all in a little white pajama outfit who, and I am sure he has not argued about what outfit to put on. His hair is beautifully combed back perfectly cleaned little face, and he probably has a clean room, is what I'm thinking. And we look at this picture, and and when I look at it, and I just think, oh, they're probably talking to each other, saying things like, mother dear, may we pray together? And the mother says, yes, my son, my love, there is nothing else I need to do but to be here with you and to pray. And for me, that is peace. 
That's the peace I long for. However, the peace I normally get is the picture. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's the one. That's reality for me. This is hair everywhere. The pencil still stuck behind my ear that I put a two hours ago. And then I'm going, where is my pencil? I can't find it. The body slumped against the wall, the shoes off. And by the way, can you tell? We don't even know where one of the shoes is. And then we have the to-do lists that have been stuck inside the book that have to be closed with, with the rubber band. And this body is exhausted. Peace has come. It's really hard to take that seriously sometimes. And and maybe it's just me, but there are moments, there are days upon days when I don't even want to turn on the TV because I know when I turn on the TV, what I'm going to see are people, adults, arguing and complaining. I'm gonna see stories about countries that are warring against each other. I am gonna see stories of citizens within their own country fighting, fighting. And then I think about even what's happening in our own community. I think about all of the prayer requests that have come across my desk, that have come into Caring Ministries, the stories of the people who have broken marriages, the strained relationships, the stories of people fighting cancer, illness, disease, and death. Peace has come, and then I'm reminded. Then I am reminded of the truth that we have been talking about through this Advent season, the truth that the gift of peace, the gift of hope, the gift of love, the gift of joy has come. It has come. It's not this fairy tale. It's not a painting. It's real. These gifts have been given to us in the form of the person, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth so that we can have these things. But the reality is there are so many days that I still fight this idea of has peace come. And I'm gonna give you a little secret. I have a little trick, this thing that I do um, when I um, am am trying to wrestle with this idea of peace. I have a song that I listen to. I take my little headphones, put put them in my ear, I pull up Google Music, and I listen to an album from 2008. Um, No judgment. Uh, It's Casting Crowns. It's their Christmas album, Peace on Earth. I love this album and it doesn't take long. Just the first few notes of the first song that starts to play and it is as if the world's stress just melts away. And there's a sense of peace that comes upon me. And I listen to the song all year round. I listen to the song anytime that I think I need to focus. I need to write a message for harvest. I need to just be able to block out the noise of the world. I will put this song, this album, the music in my ears. And the very first song on this album is I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Do you all know this one? It is an old song. It has been made um, over and over again, but the words of this song actually come from a poem uh, that was written in 1863 by a very famous poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And the story behind this song is the fact that Henry, when he wrote it, was grieving. His wife had died just a few years earlier in this tragic fire. He was a single father of six children. His oldest child, his oldest son, decided to go off and fight in the Civil War. Henry had just received word that his son had been gravely injured, was probably going to be paralyzed for the rest of his life. And Henry left and went to Washington, D.C. to to go find his son. And on Christmas Day, he is walking along the streets and he hears the bells ring from the church, announcing to all Christmas service. And he wrote these words. I'm just gonna share a few of these words with you. I heard the bells on Christmas Day 
their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then from each black accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south. And with the sound, the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Interesting that even in the midst of struggle, even in the midst of grieving, even in the midst of an uncertain future for him and for his son, he could still write about peace. Peace has come. The series we've been talking and looking at stories and seeing how these gifts have come to us. Through Simeon's story, we found out that hope has come. Through Joseph's story, that joy has come or that love has come. Through Mary's story, that joy has come. And today, we're gonna look at Zachariah's story and we are going to see how truly peace has come. And as we look at this story, these are two things that I want us to find. I want us to see how we can redefine peace and how we can rediscover peace. Now, as you get out your Bibles, if you have them, um, go ahead and turn to Luke 1. We're gonna go near the end of the chapter, starting in 67, but let me give you context to Zachariah's story because so many of us, we're probably very, very familiar with the story of Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. Some of us may not be as familiar with the story of Elizabeth and Zachariah. So I wanna give you a little background to kind of tell you where this came um, to be. So the prequel of Jesus, story. What we know is that an angel came to Mary and to Joseph and said, hey, you're going to have a baby. And they went, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. But okay, this is great. Awesome. And then uh, that's exactly how that, have you not read that? That's, that's my translation. Um, and then an angel comes to Elizabeth and that is Mary's older cousin and says, you're gonna have a baby. I know you're, you're older, um, and, but you've always wanted a baby. Well, guess what? It's gonna happen. God is gonna give you a baby. His name is gonna be John and he is going to prepare the way for the Messiah. And Elizabeth is overjoyed, cannot believe it. Then the angel comes to Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, and tells him the same thing. And Zechariah's response is, uh, I don't think so. And so um, apparently that is not the way you respond to an angel. Uh, and so God just said, um, fine, I'm gonna close up your mouth for the entirety of the pregnancy. Now, let me just stop there because as a pastor, it is our job to really dive deep into these messages, into the scripture to find truth. And I so desperately want to spend the rest of my time uh, making a correlation between a husband who cannot speak for nine months and the story of peace. <laughs> However, I love my husband. I love my family and I would like peace. So I'm not going there. Okay, so, so now that you know where we are in the story, we are going to go ahead and, and, and look at, at Luke um, because what happens, Elizabeth gives birth to the child and uh, they say, oh, Elizabeth says, we're gonna name him John. The people in the village say, well, that's not really how that works. We're gonna have to name the child after the husband. No, no, no. They go to Zachariah. Zachariah, what are you gonna name this child? He writes on a tablet, his name is John. Through that act of obedience, his mouth is opened and the very first thing that he wants to do is what? Praise God. He wants to start and prophesy. And so this is what he does. So this passage is called Zechariah's Song. So it's kind of long, but I want us to read through the whole thing. And again, remember, you're looking for how we redefine peace and how we rediscover it. So starting in verse 67. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, 
Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he had said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies, from the hand of all who hates us, to show his mercy to our ancestors, to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet feet into the path of peace. Now what Zechariah is doing is he is redefining peace. He is taking both the Hebrew, which is the language of the Old Testament, peace, which is translated shalom, which means completeness or wholeness. And he's taken peace, the Greek language peace, the language of the New Testament, irene, that peace, which means to bind together that which has been separated. And so this peace, this irene, is part of this larger picture of completeness. And he's saying to have peace, you need to reconcile, you need to bring together that which is separated, which is us from God because of our sin. And when we do that, it is part of this larger picture of wholeness or completeness that God gives us. So Zachariah's song says, yes, peace has come because God has come. We can have peace, we can have um, a, a reconciliation of our relationship with God because he is giving us his son Jesus and it is through Jesus that we're going to have completeness and wholeness. So peace is not about your circumstances, but when you reconcile your relationship with Christ, with Jesus, you can have peace. You can have a peace between you and God. You can have a peace within yourself because you have received forgiveness for your sins, for your past. You can have peace in your circumstances because it's not about whether you have money in the bank or not, whether you have a job to go to or not. It's not about that. Peace is with God, you and God together. And you can have a peace about the future. You can have a peace about what's gonna happen in the future because God is faithful. God never changes. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So because of that, you can have peace in your life. So he has redefined peace for us. He has redefined it through Jesus. And Jesus tells us in John chapter 16, verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So what we have learned here is that peace is not a perfect life. Peace is the perfect gift. So he has redefined the idea of what peace should look like in our lives. So if we can redefine it, in those terms, then we can rediscover it. Zechariah spends the first half of his prophecy looking at God, looking at all the ways that God has worked, all the ways that God will continue to work. He's working in their lives now. He's providing salvation for us. And then he turns and the second half of his prophecy is about his son. Because Zechariah knows that God is going to bring this peace to the world and offer it and he's going to do it by using his people specifically through using John. So God is gonna take this story of John and the story of Jesus 
and weave them together for the purpose of giving us peace through salvation. So this is what I love about the story of of John. Um, He is, in fact, let me just look, if you look at some of the words from the prophecy, where we look at the words he talks about his son, he says, you will be called a prophet of the most high, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way, to give people the knowledge of salvation. So how is it that he's gonna do that? I like to call it the prepare and share plan. This is what John's life is about. He is going to prepare and then he's going to share. Now, let me ask you something. I I really think, honestly, you guys have like a gift of hospitality. I think I missed out on that somewhere in my life. I don't know. So for 11 months out of the year, I am the reluctant host. Like, I want people in my house. I want you to come over. I want to share. But I come up with so many excuses. Like, well, I'd have people over, but I really need to replace the dining room chairs. They're, you know, they're not perfect. Um, I really need to touch up the painting on the the baseboards because the kids have been running, uh, you know, the roller, the um, skateboard through the house. And so I can't have people over if I need to paint. Um, I need to do some yard work. We need some color in the backyard if I'm gonna have anyone over. So I don't know what it is, but I come up with these excuses and I don't invite you people over to my house. I'm so sorry, but this is why. Um, But I don't know what it is. Something changes. Like the the day of Thanksgiving on when, when the decorations for Christmas come out and I've got the tree up and the lights are up and the garland's up and the candles are out. Like I can't wait to have you guys over. I have completely prepared my house. I have completely prepared for Christmas and now I can't wait to share. Now, of course, none of y'all come over because you're used to not being invited. But anyway, it is like, I don't know what it is. It is this idea of needing to prepare in order to share our joy. And John lived his entire life in preparation for the Messiah. He lived his whole life looking, longing, wanting for the Messiah. He lived a righteous life. He lived a life with his eyes open, watching for Jesus so that he could receive this gift of Jesus so that he could then share it with others. I think there's, I think there's a a good reason for us to begin preparing for Christmas weeks months in advance. I think there's good reason why some of us get out our decorations when the Thanksgiving turkey is still on the table. I do because I believe that what we really need to do is spend time in intentionality, preparing, focusing what we've done all year long to get our eyes focused on Christ, looking and longing for the gift that is coming. I think it's a good thing. Now, um, a few weeks ago, I was scrolling through my Facebook page and I um, stopped on this clergy Facebook group that I'm on. And a pastor, a friend of mine, um, told this story. She's like, well, I was heading to an Advent lunch and I got there, I found my table and this is what I found as my centerpiece. Now, sweet little nativity, you know, complete with baby Jesus. It's all good, but there's a problem. That thing is encased in plastic. It is wrapped up tight. I don't know if they were afraid Jesus would get out or someone else would get in. But there is something inherently wrong with that picture. Jesus is a gift that is given to us to get out, to come to us. Jesus is a gift that we are supposed to open, that we're supposed to receive, that we're supposed to share. Jesus is a gift that is supposed to get into us and we're supposed to get into him and his heart. He's given us that gift. In 1955, Jill Miller wrote um, the lines to a song that ended up just sweeping across the nation. And it it was such a great time because the world was beginning to really struggle um, so, 
oh my gosh, in such a, a strong way with racism and prejudice. Um, but a decade before, Jill had been struggling in her life um, to the point she committed, she attempted to commit suicide. But on the other side of that attempt, she had a profound experience with Jesus and a profound experience where she figured out just how much she was loved, where she learned that God had created her for a purpose. So here she was 10 years later with a group of young people who were struggling with the chaos of the world, who were struggling with the worries of the world. And she wrote the words and the song, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. What a beautiful message for us this Christmas. Peace has come. Peace has come in the form of Jesus as a gift to get out of the manger and into your heart. We need to realize that that's what peace is. And once we've redefined it, once we've readied ourselves to receive that gift, we can't hold it for ourselves. We're supposed to share it. So peace needs to begin with you. Peace needs to begin with the ways that you reconcile your relationship with God, the way you reconcile your relationship with family members who maybe that's not going really well right now. Peace needs to come from you as you walk across the street, make friends with your neighbors, the ways that you invite people into church. Peace has come. Let us receive it and then let us share it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us fresh eyes to see what peace really is. Thank you for giving us a, a fresh heart um, to receive your love and your joy and your hope. And yes, Lord, your peace. I pray that as we ready ourselves, as we prepare for the coming of your Son, I pray that we wouldn't keep it to ourselves, but that we would turn and share all of these gifts with those who are around us. We love you, Father. We thank you for this time. It's in your name we pray, amen.